let's go ahead and get started with the example that I had up on uh, the, the community site was basically this pipeline um, that uses the expression libraries just in a, an example way. So the reason why I like these expression libraries so much, Judy, you kind of hit the main point that I've typically seen expression libraries used for is creating that environment agnostic uh, set of pipelines so that as you move your code into different environments, you can simply reset the expression libraries without having to affect your ETL code. Works marvelously for uh, everything from account names to uh, the static variables that can control such things like your S3 buckets yeah. that you need access to, um, the, the Samba shares that you may need to, to write to or even directory paths that you would write to. All fabulous uses, um, but one of the things that I have realized recently uh, is that expression libraries also provide you a way to create user-defined functions. So looking at the libraries that we have associated with the sample pipeline, um, I created, and these are by no means extensive, um, but they are a simple set of functions that can provide uh, some really basic, uh, for instance, like the date formatting. I know that one thing that a lot of uh, customers tend to struggle with and trip over is the date handling. Uh, developers are inconsistent with setting their time zones when they're doing date manipulation, or they're inconsistent with the, the date format that's used uh, between different environments or applications, processes, uh, being able to create a default file format for your date timestamps um, so that everything is consistent when you go to look at uh, any of the files that may be written. And of course, all of these expression libraries um, can be overridden at different levels. And we can talk about that in a moment too. Um, but what I wanted to get into with these expression libraries are these user-defined functions um, that can be created using expression libraries. And of course, these are typically like single string type operations um, where you can't do multiple lines of JavaScript, but it does let you set a default behavior uh, for things like, I want to format a date. Well, I know that a lot of newcomers into SnapLogic and JavaScript, they're not overly familiar with the, the date formatting uh, particularly when it comes to time zone, locale, and uh, the date format strings. So this just gives a, a very simplified way for, uh, for instance, your citizen developers to come in and be able to format a date consistently, automatically applying the time zone, um, and then you could even let it default into the, the format for that date timestamp. It can always be overridden by specifying those parameters to the function, um, which will simply take in if the uh, the time zone is specified, um, it uses the time zone that's passed in, otherwise it will default back to what's already in this library. Simple functions such as grabbing the first day of the month, um, which can even use functions within the same library. So in this case, my first day of month is simply reusing the trunk function to the month, um, which again is a, another user-defined function here, so to speak that passes in the date parameter to be truncated and which level you want to format, you want to truncate to. So year, month, day, hour, minute, second. Um, and it simply is using the, the standard JavaScript calls uh, for date functions, resetting the, the month to the first month, resetting the year, or the, I'm sorry, the month here is the first month for the year truncate and the day of the month is the first day. So this truncate to year simply resets the month and day to one. Everything else gets set to zero. So now you have your date truncated to the first of the month. And the same thing for all these other truncates, um, whether we're doing the month, day, hour, minute, second, it simply resets the values for each of the, the pieces that we don't want anymore. So that was one of the things that I really liked about being able to use these expression libraries also is being able to reuse some of these pieces and make these calls a little bit more simple. So the last day of the month does the same thing, first truncates to the month and then uses the other 
uh, date functions to add a month and subtract a day. So now I have the last day of, the, of whatever month is passed in. Converting to EPOC and from EPOC is again something that is fairly common at client sites, particularly when they're dealing with uh, Unix or mainframe systems that use EPOC dates. Um, getting age, pretty simple function. I had a client request a while back, you know, hey, how do I figure out a person's age uh, based on their birth date? So I put this together pretty quickly, um, simply taking the, uh, oh, I, it also allows for you to say, what was their date? What was their age as of, you know, a particular date? And it might have been, how old were they when they were hired? And how old are they now um, to, to get just other basic information. So again, pretty simple. We just parse the date, um, subtracting out the, the original date, and then subtracting from 1970, which is the base date. Um, and this does uh, the date manipulation correctly. So you will get an accurate age, uh, even, if they're, even if they were born before 1970, the age still does work. Segment hour, this is one that I had put together. This is, again, this was a very specific request. Um, I had a client that wanted to segment their hours by every 15 minute interval. So what they wanted is, regardless of the date timestamp that was passed in, they wanted what to be returned as uh, the top of the hour, 15 after, 30 after, 45 after. Um, so I simply took that to the next level and said, okay, well, let's just make it so they can divide it into any number of segments. So if they pass in a date and say num segments is four, that gives them the 0, 30, 45, sorry, 0, 15, 30, 45. Um, but let's say that they want 10 minute intervals. They give it a num segments of six and it returns a 10 minute intervals. So that's kind of the overview of creating your user defined functions. Uh, date again also does give in uh, some like environment specific uh, pieces as well, and so that you can set your base or default time zone and your default date formatting so that if they're not specified, it doesn't return anything. So the string functions, um, a little more complex, not quite as many functions, so we'll step through this a little bit more carefully. Um, the LPAD and RPAD, basically what they sound like, it just takes a string and pads some number of characters to the left uh, to fill a specific size. RPAD fills the characters to the right up to a specific si a specified size. Um, pretty simple concept. I'm not going to step through the logic of it, but essentially it's just looking at the, the length of the string and filling it to the appropriate size based on the fill character that you desire. Again, these, these aren't necessarily meant to be um, prime candidates for reuse, although some of these may be. Um, they're really just trying to show examples of how things may be done. The object key value pairs and key value pairs to object, this again was a very specific client request um, that I threw in here just to help show some of the object manipulation that can be done. Uh, so this object to key value pairs takes an object or even a portion of a JSON object um, and creates it as a string of the, those key value pairs. So if I have an object that has three fields, it will take those fields as field equal the field value, ampersand field equal field value, or whatever key value and data value separators you want to use. And we can get we can demonstrate that uh, in the example pipeline here in a moment. Flatten object, again, something pretty specific. Um, actually, this can be fairly reused. One of the, the, the things that I know happens with several of our snaps is for instance, if you're doing a database lookup, so you're passing your object along, you do a database lookup, and now everything that came into that lookup is now in the original object. Well, I want that everything in original to still be with everything that I just looked up. So this is a very simple way, um, and I know this can be done as structure or uh, otherwise in a mapper, but within the mapper, you can simply say, pull everything from uh, into my root object dollar from original and you would specify original as a quoted string and it will simply extend that object with all the values coming from that original object and again i'll show i'll demonstrate that in a moment number with commas is a good example i have 
this big number and I want to put a comma in every third position. This essentially does that. It also handles the fractional portion uh, simply by uh, reappending that fractional portion back onto the string. So this does return a string that represents the number with your comma formatting. So if you want to you know, format your money as you know, dollar and comma separated numerics to make it easier to read for humans, this is a pretty simple function to use. And finally, the bytes to file size. Um, this is just, again, it's just a simple uh, formatting piece that will format your very large number uh, to represent a file size. So it can go up all the way to Yadabyte. I don't think anybody's going to have a file size that's going to exceed that for quite some time yet, um, but it can take any big int value and reformat it as a more human readable layout. So let's actually see this thing in motion. I have a simple JSON generator that creates these objects for me. Um, let's go ahead and expand these out. And we can see that somewhere in my process, I've created this original uh, value, which may contain the employee and brand. I thought I had one example in here that uh, had a different layout, but these are all different records. Um, so let's see, first of all, let's see what the flatten object does. So the call, you can see again, here's my original object tucked underneath everything else that I wanna have the information merged into. So the Flatten object call pretty simply is just, I want to use the root and I want to pull everything that's in this original sub object back into root. So now if I look at the output, what I should see are those two extra fields for employee and brand are now merged in with everything else in the root object. Again, can be done with a structure snap, um, but this just provides that extra layer of being able to do that within the mapper, just an example. The rest of the function calls, uh, we'll take a little bit more time to, to work through. Let me make sure I have my dynamic validate on. Yeah, okay. So the LPAD, if we look at the preview, you can see that what comes in from department was 1100, 1200, 13, 13 14. Um, and it simply is getting left padded out to whatever size that I've specified. So again, if I change this to nine, what I should see is now I've got uh, five zeros that precede my number to make sure that that is a nine character field. RPAD, same thing. You may have cases where your target database is expecting these fields to be, or even you know, fixed, creating fixed width records, uh, pretty handy for this. Uh, be able to call the RPAD to make sure that I've padded out. And by the way, you can change this to whatever character you want for the fill. And now we can see, or even, you know, dots if I want to align that way. The object key value pairs, again, this was that specific request. Um, the, the client needed to take an object and be able to pass it to a rest call uh, using the, the key value pair syntax. Um, it does also allow for encoding. Uh, so the URL encoding, this last parameter, if we set this to false or ignore it um, altogether, the default value will pick in. Uh, but if I don't have that URL encoded, you can see I no longer have those uh, HTML encoding and the percent twenties to fill in the spaces, et cetera. And the separators, if I wanted to change the ampersand that separates each of the values, let's put in a semicolon. So now we can see that uh, my values are separated by semicolons. So that may be an easy different use case. And the opposite is taking those key value pairs and I'm gonna change that to an object. So we can see that this is now taking that value. Sorry, I didn't mean to scroll my screen there. We can see that this is now creating an object out of these key value pairs with the field name as the piece that is before the equal sign, and then the value is everything after that equal sign, uh, but before that data value separator, which the value, data value separator in this case is the ampersand. The bytes to file size, pretty simple, uh, takes that huge number, 
and formats it down into something more human readable. So if I add a few more characters, that should get me up into the petabyte range. And the number with commas, again, just formatting that as a string. Um, if, I t if I, oh, here is one thing. The precision uh, being six, uh, you can see that it has dropped off the last digit from the, uh, the decimal place. So if I want to drop that down to two, you can see it drops it down to the, only the two-digit place. Now, finally, we're getting into the date formatting. Um, so the defaults that are specified in the expression library, I'm using the central time zone, and I'm using this formatting. Uh, for my date string. So if I specify the date string, you can see it uses the format specified and the time zone specified. If I take off that time zone, you can see that the time adjusted. And then taking off the, uh, the format, as in this case, it uses the defaults uh, right now, it is actually 9.22 Central Time, even though I'm in Eastern. The date trunks, uh, truncating to the hour, truncating to the day. Ah, see, I used the wrong format. So it comes back and it tells me I just used the wrong format. So I need to specify it as DD in lowercase. So now I'm truncated to the day. I can truncate to the hour which I already had, sorry, truncate to the month. But I'm going to keep it at minute. Uh, the same with the functions for the last day of the month. Yes, last day of the month is the 31st. First day of the month is going to be, yep, there we go, 1st of July. Converting to and from epoch. So if, if uh, you were to take this epoch time converting back to a string date, um, if you, you can use some of the online resources and confirm that these are working the way that they're supposed to. And here's the segment to the hour. Uh, so right now it is, um, yeah, UTC is 1423. So truncating that to four segments would be every 15 minutes. If I do it to the 10 minutes, we should see the 20. Yep, there we go. Now, I did originally have an XML encode and decode, um, but someone on the community actually pointed out that um, there was another way to do it, which made me look a little bit further and realize that SnapLogic now has an HTML encode and decode, um, so I no longer needed those functions. So I'm using the, the built-in SnapLogic, HTML encode and decode now, uh, which work very nicely, by the way. In fact, it was much extended from the example that I had. And finally, the get age um, of the higher date, if we were to look at the incoming data, we would see what their age um, is, <laughs> which actually, oh, because it's the age of the higher date. So it's how long they've they've been on on staff. So the first record, um, I'm going to have to assume that he was hired in 2020. Yep. So he's he's not been there a year yet, so he's still at zero. Uh, Mr. Dunn here, however, he's been around for five years, so the second record should be a five. Yep. 